Hi, uh, my name is Emily Regan, and I'm going to be reading an excerpt from my latest book called Family Pride. Um, to give you a little bit of context, it's a historical fiction that takes place in the late 1920s when the MGM movie studio decided to fly their mascot lion from California to New York, and then they ended up crashing outside Payson. So here's a little bit of that for you. The secretary's typewriter punctuated the silence and echoed off the percussive ceiling as Howard Strickland waited on an uncomfortable leather couch. He hadn't the faintest idea as to why LB wanted to see him, but he had been summoned. The, the uncertainty made him feel a bit like a boy waiting to see the principal, although he couldn't think of a single reason why he might be in trouble. However, the longer he waited, the more nervous he felt. Howard began to tap his foot, the quiet metronome of his shoe leather providing a steady beat to the typewriter's melody. A sudden buzz from the secretary's desk froze Howard's foot. He watched as she picked up the heavy receiver and held it to her ear. She murmured a few words before replacing the receiver. Mr. Mayor is ready to see you, Mr. Strickland, she announced. Thank you, Howard said, rising to his feet. The secretary nodded and waited until Howard opened the office door before, before she resumed her typing. Louis B. Mayer sat behind his large, impressive desk that would have dwarfed his 5'7 frame had it not been for the extra 10 feet of confidence and power he projected. L.B. was rifling through a few sheets of paper, and when Howard entered, he raised his eyes. Howard, thanks for meeting me, he said, gesturing to one of the chairs facing his desk. Please sit. Howard sat. I called you here to discuss an idea, L.B. began. I want to do something big, something to get MGM into all the papers. What do you mean, Howard asked. Hearst already exclusively features MGM stars and films. No, no, something else. We have film and star publicity, but every other studio does the same thing. I want to do something else, something Universal has never thought of. He, he paused for a moment. Howard, did you hear about the Dole Derby? You mean that crazy air race a few days ago when all the pilots died? Not all. Two of the pilots made, successfully made the flight. Out of how many? That part isn't important. Look, I'll cut to the chase. What I want, LB explained, pausing a moment for effect, is to fly the lion. The lion? You mean Leo the lion, Howard asked? Yes. I want to get one of those pilots to fly him from Culver City to New York, LB said, illustrating the transcontinental flight with an arc of his hand. Howard thought for a moment. That could work, he said slowly, the familiar wheels of publicity strategizing beginning to gain momentum. People love that lion. Plus, we'd be capitalizing on the excitement caused by Lindbergh. Exactly. I want you to get one of the pilots. Their names are Goebel and Jensen, I think. I'd prefer Goebel since he won, but really, either will do. I also want to build a new plane for the flight. A new plane, Howard asked. If we're going to take advantage of the momentum of Lindbergh and the Dolder, we will have to fly out as soon as possible. Building a plane to accommodate a lion in its cage could take a while. Don't forget the trainer, LB added. That lion's a pussycat, but I haven't a clue as to how he'll react in a plane if he panics. You do realize the magnitude of what you're asking for in such a short period of time, don't you? Howard asked, the question sounding more like a statement. LB smiled and raised one eyebrow. Guess you have quite the to-do list, LB said, leaning back in his chair. Howard resisted the urge to protest or pinch the bridge of his nose and sigh deeply. Not a problem. Good, LB said, returning to his papers and all at once signaling that their meeting was over. Howard stood and turned towards the door. He nearly closed it behind him when LB called after him. Let me know which pilot you get. Just before Martin Jensen's plane touched the ground, he felt his breathing quicken and his stomach tighten. No matter how many times he flew, he always had a momentary panic that he wouldn't be able to successfully land the plane, like maybe he'd used up all of his lucky landings and this was the time he'd crash into an epically cinematic ball of flames. But then the wheels connected to the ground with a reassuring thump and Martin's body relaxed, loosening back to its base state as if he'd never been afraid. Martin gently pulled the plane to a stop and cut the engines. The roar of the crowd replaced the roar of the propellers and Martin grinned to himself before climbing out of the plane. Of course he landed perfectly, why wouldn't he? He waved to the stands overflowing with fairgoers, all of whom were cheering wildly. Martin rather enjoyed these county fair exhibitions, the screams of the crowd, the feeling of victory when the plane touched down. As he waved, he saw a man jogging towards him from the edge of his peripheral vision. Mr. Jensen, he called over the noise. I'm from the telegraph office. You have an urgent message. Can it wait a moment, Martin asked, not breaking a smile or his wave to the crowd. I was told to come collect you as soon as you landed, the man said, shielding his eyes from the sun that permeated the bright Southern California sky. Martin sighed, hating to leave. All right, let's go, Martin said. Man turned and began to walk away, leaving Martin to skip a few steps forward to keep up. 
Great job up there, by the way, the man said as the two began to make their way through the fairgrounds. I don't think I could ever do something like that so high up in the air. I'm quite happy with my feet firmly on the ground, thank you very much. And that race you did? What was it, the banana flight or something? The Dole Derby. It was sponsored by the Pineapple Company, Martin corrected, feeling slightly annoyed. Right, right, you flew to Hawaii. Imagine flying through the air like a bird to get there. The wife wants me to take her there, but we would be traveling by boat, like sensible folks, the man said, jovially punching Martin in the arm a bit too hard as they approached the telegraph station Western Union had set up at the edge of the fairgrounds. The man opened the door and motioned for Martin to enter the office. Martin did so and was momentarily blinded as his eyes attempted to adjust to the darkness of the office. Let's see here, the man said, rooting around his desk and shifting stacks of messages. You really get this many messages at a county fair? Martin asked. Oh yes, the man said. You'd be surprised by how many come through. Mostly births and deaths, things like that. Ah, here we are, he said, picking up the correct paper and handing it over to Martin. Your presence is required at MGM ASAP. Stop. Please respond with date and time of arrival. Stop. Howard Strickland. Stop. Metro Goldwyn Mayor. Stop. As Martin read, brow furrowed, a large yellow cat ambled out from underneath the desk to rub against Martin's boots. He glanced down at it distastefully and tried to gently push it away from him, but it only seemed to make the damn thing more determined to rub against him. What on earth could a movie studio want with me? Martin asked himself aloud as he returned his eyes to the telegram before eyeing his pant leg. It would take ages to get the fur off now. He tried to subtly step away, but the cat followed him. Dunno, the man said, coming around the desk to scoop up the cat. MGM sounds exciting, though. I actually named little Leo here after their mascot. You know, the lion? Martin nodded and tried not to grimace at the cat. He'd never found much use for them. A dog, on the other hand, now that was a man's animal. Want me to send a message back? The man asked as he scratched Leo behind his ears and the cat purred loudly. Yes, please wire back that I'll be on the train tonight and be at the studio at 10 tomorrow morning. Martin turned to exit the office. Sure thing, boss. Hey, maybe you'll get lucky and they'll put you in the pictures, the man called after him. In spite of himself, Martin couldn't help but smile. Maybe they'd heard about the Dole Derby and wanted to make a film about it. Of course, I'd have to mention the other guys since he had, after all, come in first. Still, the idea was exciting. Jensen tried to keep himself from imagining himself on the red carpet of his movie premiere as he hurried to collect his belongings and headed to the train station. Martin disembarked his train with his small suitcase in hand. The platform was crowded with people, but he easily made his way through the crowd to the street where a line of people waited for cabs. When it was his turn, he climbed into a weather-beaten yellow taxi. The leather seat had a rip in it, and Martin found it difficult to look away. Where to? the cabbie asked. Metro Goldwyn Mayor on Washington, Martin replied. Oh yeah, the driver said, pulling away from the curb. You a big movie star or something? Martin laughed. No, I'm a pilot. Well, maybe they want you to do some movie stunts, the cab driver said. Yeah, maybe. When Martin approached the film studio and saw the gates of Metro Goldwyn Mayor for the first time, it seemed to him that someone in charge had a god complex. The huge white Grecian columns lined the building and the massive gates could very well have been the gates of heaven. Martin half expected to find St. Peter in the security booth. Name, the seemingly bored security guard asked without looking up. Martin Jensen, who you seeing? Um, Martin said, fishing the folded telegram out of his breast pocket. Howard Strickland. Guard looked up and studied Martin's face for a moment before turning to a neat stack of papers on the desk. Jensen, Martin nodded. Head down that street till you reach the end and you'll see a big gray building. Those are the offices, and if you talk to the front desk, they'll point you to Mr. Strickland. Okay, thanks, Martin said, turning to walk onto the studio lot. Hey, the guard said, suddenly stopping him. Make sure you don't wander around trying to meet anyone famous. Everyone here works, and I can't have characters taken advantage, you hear? Yeah, all right, Martin said, rolling his eyes. Clearly, this guy didn't read the papers. Martin headed through the lot and down the street. It hadn't occurred to him to watch for movie stars until the guard said anything, but he glanced around as he walked, trying to be subtle. However, the only people he saw looked like low-level production assistants carrying clipboards. He found it odd that the streets were paved with assistants instead of stars, but Martin thought that maybe most of them were shooting on sound stages or something. He'd expected at least one extra in a gladiator outfit or something, but maybe gladiators were old hats since Ben Hur had already been in theaters a few years earlier. Oh well, Greta Garbo would have to fall in love with him another time. As he strolled, he saw a familiar-looking man eating a sandwich on an upturned crate. His odd, flat hat with a narrow brim was pushed back on his head, and the man took a bite, surveying the MGM street. He nodded at Martin, who nodded back, still trying to place him as a stagehand opened the door beside the man. Mr. Keaton, they need you on set, the stagehand said apologetically, eyeing the uneaten food in the star's hands. Keaton nodded, swallowing his mouthful of food as he stood and followed the stagehand inside. Martin smiled a little, thinking of his own telegraphic summons from the studio. No matter if you were a famous pilot or a big star like Buster Keaton, when MGM said jump, you jumped. 
He made his way to the building the guard had described and found himself in a big, open office with an extensive, yet very attractive, center pool. He inquired about directions at the first desk, which was occupied by a lovely br brunette in a navy skirt. She smiled and pointed him towards the back of the room towards another secretary, whose desk sat importantly apart from the others. He introduced himself to the appointed secretary, who nodded before announcing his presence into the heavy black phone at her desk. Mr. Strickland will see you now, the secretary said, smiling at Martin from behind her desk. She was pretty, with blonde hair pulled back from her face and a heart-shaped mouth painted red like a valentine. When Martin passed by her desk, he caught sight of her slender legs crossed at the ankles. He let his eyes linger for a moment before entering the office. Mr. Jensen, Howard said, extending a ha standing to extend a hand. Thank you for coming to meet me on such short notice. You're welcome, Martin said, taking a seat after Howard gestured to the chair facing his desk. What's this all about? First of all, congratulations on your performance in the Dole Derby. Flying that far is impressive, especially since you were one of two that even completed the race. Thank you. Martin noticed that Mr. Strickland technically did not mention that Martin had placed second in the race. Second of all, I have a proposition for you, Howard continued. What sort of proposition? Howard sat up in his chair and leaned forward a little conspiratorially. We here at MGM are impressed with your pilot skills, and we have you in mind for an event we're staging. That is, if you're interested. What sort of event? Howard paused, forming a steeple with his fingers. Do you know our logo? The one that appears at the start of all our pictures? The one with the lion? Leo, that's right, Howard said. We want you to fly the lion from California to New York. It'd be a huge production with a mountain of press. After something like that, you could write your ticket for the rest of your life. You could be the next Lindbergh. Hey, Martin said. I'm already an established pilot. I get plenty of press on my own. Howard waved his hand as he leaned back in his chair as if showing a fly. You're a good pilot, but your 15 minutes of fame are almost up on the Dole Derby. Sure, you can keep doing your county fair exhibitions, but that's small time. Howard leaned back across the de desk towards Martin. I am offering you an opportunity to partake in an event that will capitalize on your celebrity and extend your public exposure. Martin thought for a moment. All right, so if I agree to this, you want me to fly a line across the country? Yes. I have to say, it might be kind of hard to focus on flying a plane if there's a lion in the cockpit with me. Howard left. Of course. We're building you a plane that would keep the lion cage, and we would send the trainer with you, just in case. In case of what? We just want to be sure everyone's safe. Besides, the lion's as docile as a house cat. I heard he ate his trainer. <laughs> Howard snorted. Rumors. None of it was true, but the publicity of that story had people talking about the lion, which had them talking about our pictures. Martin nodded. Any press is good press? Something like that. So, if I agree to do this, when would the flight take place? Two weeks from yesterday. You can build a plane that fast? Howard laughed. This is MGM. We can do whatever we want. Besides, we've already got the boys working on it. Come on, Jensen, are you in or out? Martin hesitated, considering the offer. Can I have a night to think about it? Howard frowned. LB was looking for an answer today. We have a lot of candidates we're reviewing, he lied. We're looking for a short answer so we can get a jump start on pre-production promotion. If you take a night, the offer might not still be here to accept, Howard licked his dry lips as he said that. What do you say? Do you want to be on the front page or do you want to go back to the county fair? Martin juggled his foot anxiously for a moment, considering Howard's words. I'm in. Thank you. Okay.